It's uh, a very rare pleasure for me to uh, be with the poet Eugene Redmond, who's an old friend. But it's even a rarer pleasure, which brings up all kinds of memories about interviews we've done over the years, to be entering, interviewing you for uh, the um, Project on the History of Black Writing Institute, uh, Don't Deny My Voice, named for our mutual friend Lorenzo Thomas. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, all the scholars here, the summer scholars, have many, many questions because they know of you as the author of Drum Voices, as the poet laureate of East St. Louis. Uh, or East Boogie, if you prefer that, <laughs> uh, as the editor of uh, the uh, works of uh, Henry Dumas, as the founding editor of Drum Voices Review, R-E-V-U-E, -E, <laughs> not the other review, and uh, also the work that you have done uh, with uh, photography for these many years, which has now become a part of the uh, critical resources that people will use. And of course, they, they don't know about your having done rituals <coughs> way back in uh, the early 70s uh, <laughs> down in <laughs> Southern and other places, or uh, many of the other things you've done in terms of international travel and uh, your work with, with young people and the Eugene Redmond Writers Club. We're going to try to talk about all of these things. But there were so many questions, uh, Professor Redmond, that I had to put them in clusters. So I'll tell you what the clusters are, and we'll try to move through them. Uh, first of all, the, 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 the bulk of the questions that people had pertain to uh, drum voices, uh, 1970. Six, how you wrote the book, what uh, your research methods were, how long it took you to do that, uh, what were some memorable adventures you might have had in putting the book together, um, uh, why you didn't try to do a second uh, drum voices, and if you were to update it, uh, who would be included in it, and so forth and so on. So uh, those are questions of, of cluster one. The second group of questions pertain to the black arts movement of which you were uh, and still are a central part. The third uh, set has to do with the role of being a poet laureate. Your poet, la poet laureate of East St. Louis, just as uh, one of our, one of your uh, auditors today is poet laureate of Kentucky. Mr. Walker. He's somewhere back there in the back of his Walker. hand. Yes, <coughs> Frank X. Walker, and uh, you know Natasha Thrathway is poet laureate both of Mississippi and of the United States. So this poet laureate business is, is kind of important, hmm. and we'd like to take uh, what what do you see as the mission then of a poet laureate? F of uh, four, the fourth cluster really has to do with your photo documentation of writers, artists, and events. Uh, and and, and uh, why has that all these years been exceptionally important? And, and w one of my uh, questions then would be, how do you wish to have that material used in the future for scholarship? And then there's the question of really your being the poet, or the questions I call questions of now-ness. So, it's very important that in, a, in addition to giving us several volumes of poetry, you also created a poetic form, the Kwansaba. And uh, I think that is uh, very, very important in your new book, uh, Arkansippi Memoirs. You talk about uh, a kind of pedagogy of place. And I'm hoping that we will also be able to include in this interview uh, reading and uh, 
comments that you would like to make about one of your favorite, one of my favorite poems, which is Parapoetics, uh, which you wrote very, very early in your career. So I'm going to ask you to just to start talking about the making of drum voices. Um, <coughs> the making of drum voices. <coughs> Let me say that um, the original plan for drum voices included photographs. So just to keep keep uh, the visual connection and idea there. Um, and let me say that when I when I reiterated or, or reincarnated drum voices in 1990 to 92 uh, as the title of a journal, I purposely spell review the way Dr. Ward spelled it, R-E-V-U-E. -E. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm constantly uh, correcting administrators and various people in different parts of the world by writing uh, back to them and putting the word review, R-E-V-U-E, -E, in quotes. Um, I chose it because I wanted pageantry, I wanted funk, I wanted the um, the follies. I wanted um, ritual. I wanted uh, the. I wanted people to experience the dramaturge at work. All those things uh, are what were on my mind when I came up with the title, the second uh, incarnation or iteration <clears throat> of Drum Voices as a title for a Drum Voices review. Uh, and just keep in mind that I am a son of Catherine Dunham's. Um, I was her confidant, bodyguard, chauffeur, translator, and um, a recruiter, chief recruiter and manager of her road company, her, the road company made up, made uh, carved from the indigenous trainees in East St. Louis, so I, I owe a lot to her. And let me say that I never would have come up with the title Drum Voices for a literary history had I not come under the tutelage of Catherine Dunham uh, and the tutelage of the Black Rebellion of the 1960s, uh, because I'd come out of a, a, a fairly intensive graduate program of classicism and modernism at Washington University. Washington University was founded by T.S. Eliot's grandfather, and we often refer to it as the uh, uh, um, Harvard of the Midwest. Um, and so coming out of that program in 1966, um, there was no way I would have called a literary history drum voices had I not, had I not run into Catherine Dunham and, and hit the streets. Uh, as I said to an advisor, I'm getting out of here because I'm tired of reading dead white poets. And, um, Later, I wrote a poem reflecting on the 60s, and the little poem goes, <clears throat> and it's in here. In the 60s, we stopped reading dead white poets <clears throat> and began reading dead black ones. The difference was that the black ones were still alive. <laughs> um, <laughs> Vintage. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, drum voices, when I left grad school, I tended to, st tended to study with Melvin Tolson. A professor at Washington University said to me, um, stop reading T.S. Eliot. And I said, um, why and for how long? He said, well, you're about to destroy the potential for your own voice. Everything is coming out of little Eliot. This is the early 60s initially we're talking, grad school. And uh, I said, for how long? He said, preferably forever, <laughs> but at least 10 years. Um, 
He said, you know as much about Elliot as any professor on this campus. So, you know, drop that. Just, you're coming out a little Elliot. So I heard about uh, Tolson, and I was hoping to go and study with Tolson, but Tolson died after three or four operations for stomach cancer. Then I dug into Tolson, and I said, I want to learn a black poet as well as I know T.S. Eliot. Um, and so you could, I could go to sleep now drunk and you could wake me up and I'll recite T.S. Eliot until you tell me to stop. <laughs> so, um, and that's what I did with Melvin Tolson. And I thought that Eliot and Pound and his, that group was, was difficult, but Tolson, whew, before he deserted the streets of Harlem and the fuel in his furnace died at curfew. My Afro-Irish Jewish grandpa said, between the Dead Sea hitherto and the promised land hence loomed the wilderness now. Although man is a boar bailed up on a ridge, the attic salt in him survived the blow of Iscariot. Atlas and the witch's Sabbath in the catacombs of Bosio. So that's what I meant when I said I wanted to run into a poet that could at least match, if not bat best, the modern, the, the dense modern that I had been under the influence of for several years. And I met Tolson, yeah. So, um, drum voices, then I, I plunged into a study of black poetry and black culture. My idea was to be prepared to teach blackness since I was approached by students and I was aware of what was happening across the country, you know, Kwanzaa and uh, black studies, the black studies movement. And, uh, and students came to me in the region, in the St. Louis, East St. Louis region, region and said, come to the campus and teach blackness. You got degrees in, in literature or whatever you have degrees from Washington UN. <laughs> come over here and teach blackness. And I said, oh, what? Um, so, teach, teach blackness. So, I would go into a classroom like Oberlin, for example, where I was writer in residence, 1969. I would go into a class bloodshot, having read the black novel, finished reading the black novel, 20 minutes before the class. I mean, where was I going to read all this? What was I going to read one novel by all the black light writers, let alone everything by Hurston, everything by Fawcett, everything by Wright. I mean, this is on the side now, because we're dealing with Swinburne and Tolstoy, you know, the whole deal. So um, I plunged into a study of blackness. I wanted to be a good teacher. I hadn't gone to a black college, so I went to one and taught two consecutive summers, seven where I met Charles Rowell, and Rowell acted in some rituals and touted that kind of work for a while. <laughs> but, uh, we'll come back to... Yeah. <laughs> no, later. But, um, and so I was really not so much, I was not so much studying to prepare to write drum bars. I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, I was really preparing to be a good teacher of black culture, black literature. And so I went after, you know, I was, I was in the right place at Oberlin, ran into John Works, you know, folk song, you know, all those great work. Oberlin had everything. And so I, I just Xeroxed tons of it. And um, uh, let's see, what did we call in the, in the Marine Corps, sort of misappropriated things when I, <clears throat> when I couldn't, liberate it, that's right. <laughs> Liberated some things when I couldn't, <laughs> when I couldn't, you know, in those days, Xeroxing was, was a job, copying something was a job. So I just went through it, you know, you know, beginning with what we call the African continuum and Jan Heinz Jans and the whole thing. I mean, just, you know, I wanted to be prepared and so, um, I dug into the black experience, the Geechee and the Gully, and you know, looked at the uh, the Barracoons and all the languages, and followed the 
the Du Boisian model, you know, um, you know, classical African civilizations into uh, the midpoint and into the the the, the diaspora, and uh, the fact that you're not able to understand a family or a community in one area of the diaspora unless you go to another area of the diaspora. So you can't understand the African-American, African-U.S. family unless you know something about the African-Brazilian family. And then you can compare and contrast diaspora and different diaspora and cultures. You can't go to one. You can't, you can't base it on only one culture. You won't understand it. So that's what we were doing. Um, and Fela Sawande, um, John Heinz John, the new African culture, African, John M. S. M. Beatty, facing Mount Kenya, with uh, Jomo Kenyatta, just, just preparing. And there were no texts for the poetry. Bones, uh, the Negro novel in America, uh, Kenneman, I mean, the studies, you know, when they started coming, like Another Man Gone and the, the Hero and the Black, I mean, you know, I was amazed, and I'm still amazed that Howard Ramsey went all the way through from undergrad to grad studying with friends of mine, brothers, with a, I mean, got a PhD. Studying, going all the way from undergrad to, to a PhD and studied with black scholars. I mean, that, that still has me reeling. As I said, we just, you know, we read it, and you know, five minutes, sometimes up to five minutes before the actual class, you were completing what you, because, you know, when were you going to read it? You're out of grad school, you're working. So, but we did the work, and as Tony Morrison said at a function not too long ago, we were tough. <laughs> we were tough. Um, and so that's what, that's what I, that's how I got into preparing to be a good teacher of black culture, the best teacher I could be. Um, I was approached by a man at City College in New York who asked me to write a, uh, a pamphlet or perhaps a, um, uh, what do you call it, what's the name for, a monograph on the teaching of black poetry. And so I wrote something, and he said, we love the bibliography, but uh, a pamph this pamphlet is too turgid. And that's when I got the contract with Doubleday. Okay, so leading up to this, I was studying uh, poetry. You know, global poetry, African-derived poetry, and we ascertained that Though we didn't find the word poet or poetry in African languages, because I joined the think tank in the mid 60s and it's been together uh, for over 50 years. And if I named some of the people, you'd recognize these great minds. And we would sit and think all night, sipping. Some people were doing other stuff, <laughs> and drink and design these courses. And one night, somebody, uh, I repeat, I'm not sure I came up with it, but we were talking about black mind, the black mind. And, and uh, it was said, niggas are schizophrenics with split personalities. <laughs> I mean, that's, George Latner was in the room, Henry Dumas was in the room. Shall I go on? The same room where that statement was made, okay? Now, we're, we're shaping, you know, you can get a PhD in five areas of black culture at the University of Wisconsin. We, we were there. I mean, it still boggles my mind. You know, just trying to get ready to go into a class and discuss a poem, and here you can go to one university now and get a PhD in five different areas of black culture, one of five different areas. So. All of that was preparing me for drum voices. So around the late 60s to the early 70s, I started to think about the book when I submitted this manuscript, uh, the proposal and some, some samples. 
And this man said to me, uh, he edited an important anthology with James Emanuel, which is a European American scholar. Um, I can't think of his name right now. Who? Theodore Gross. That's him, Theodore Gross. Uh, he said the bibliography is astounding, but it's just too, it's too dense for a pamphlet. And that made me start thinking. I found, by the way, how would I found, I found that manuscript. We've been talking about it. So I, I found the original uh, manuscript for the original pamphlet that I was going to, the monograph I was going to do. Um, so I started working on it, and I and I was I was hooking up with these poets in all the cities. Uh, Quincy Troop and I would grab a slab of barbecue, um, a case of Heineken's, <laughs> some Granddad, and hit the road. And we'd go from city to city and center to center and university to university, reading poetry, hanging out. And I met the Watts poets, and I met the Cleveland poets in East Cleveland, Norman Jordan and all those people. I met the poets in the South. Tom Dent took me to see the breastworks. Neither, neither of us knew what breastworks were, that uh, were the first black soldiers engaged the, the South, the Confederacy in the Civil War. So we're walking around and we knocked on a door and we said, where are the breastworks? Now Tom is supposed to be showing me around and the woman said, you're standing on them. <laughs> so there were just sort of ridges behind uh, which the, um, um, the black troops insulated themselves to fight the uh, Union, I mean, at the Confederate Army. So I was there and I met, I met uh, Jerry Ward, you know, Charles Rao, Tom Dent, Kalamo Yas Yasalam, who was Val Ferdinand then. And all over, I went to Atlanta and the brother who had the workshop at Fisk, in, I mean in Nashville, not, not John O, but the brother who recently, who wrote a book about his family, about Spike Lee's ancestors. Oh, of, of Stone. Stone. Yeah, Stone. Yeah, Brother Stone. And so I went from city to city and I took notes and I did some taping. Uh, all the while I was in basements and attics and uh, back rooms of churches, trunks of cars. I was given LPs by different people. People whose names you won't hear unless you read drum bosses because they weren't known outside of their immediate space. And that's what I did. I went all over the place uh, collecting and just having fun with these brothers and sisters, like Carolyn Rogers, Johari Amini, who was um, uh, Jewel Lattimore, Donnell Lee. Uh, the first book was autographed in 66 before he became Haki Matubuti and Gwendolyn Brooks. Uh, I borrowed uh, uh, traditions and habits from these poets. The first time I saw Gwendolyn Brooks read, she read 20 minutes and then let all these big haired poets come up. <laughs> and Gwendolyn Brooks had won the Pulitzer Prize when I was in junior high school. And I thought, wow, how could she deflate herself like that by reading 20 minutes and then giving the floor to Sterling Plump and Don L. Lee and Walter Bradford, and on and on. I said, whoa, this is amazing. I said I'd never use that word, you know. It was invented during the presidential election. Absolutely and amazing. Um, anyway, it was incredible. Uh, and, and I do that. I go on the road, take my poets. And by the way, the people say, well, why, why do your poets stay within the time frame? Other people get up there and just go on and read forever. I said, because their asses won't get on the stage anymore. <laughs> if, they, if they don't read within a certain, is it four minutes? It's four minutes. My poets are going to be in that range, you know. Because, you know, it, it's, it's, all, it's, it's all part of a disciplining process. You know, you don't get up there and, you know, take, take half the time and you got 15 more poets, half the whole evening and you got 15 more poets. So, but, but anyway, I, I, I learned that I got, first time I saw somebody do that was Gwen Brooks in Chicago. And that was, a, I heard uh, Howard say this morning that he, uh, 
somebody said this is about seven pages. <laughs> so I said, that's what it's about. So I got into drum voices and uh, the process was about eight years collecting this, all this stuff. And um, interestingly, enough, in interestingly enough, I'm going around the horn to these memorials and funerals. The same poet, I spoke at Carolyn Rogers' uh, funeral in 2010. I mean, the same poets that I met in between 65 and 69. I'm going back around, of course, they'll be coming to mine. But uh, I was at Jane Cortez's uh, uh, celebration at Cooper Union in February. And uh, that's, that's the way it, uh, you know, that's, that's the way it goes. That, that's, that's how we do what we do. So, uh, and then a couple of years to write it, I was telling Jerry about an experience, you know, at lunch. Uh, at lunch, I was telling him about an experience I had that my father died while I was writing drum voices. And I was sitting with a grad student at a table in my dining room. The phone rang, I took it from the wall inside the kitchen nook and I was told by a sibling that a father had died. I hung up the phone and got back to work with her and Julie, uh, this was in Sacramento. I, I wrote the book in Sacramento because I was teaching there at the time, Cal State, and she said something's wrong and I said what? I'm looking around like that. <laughs> she said, I said what? She said uh, something's wrong. And I said, uh, oh, we're fine. So we're checking the bibliography. We've got 4,000 items for the bibliography. And we want four or 500. <laughs> These are all on cards now. No computer, of course, mid-70s. And uh, she said, it's your father, isn't it? And I said, yes. Yeah. But we had this deadline and nothing I could do. I'm in California. I'm, I'm going to go back for the funeral. but." You know, let's 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 do this. So, um, the uh, I called Margaret Walker and asked her if I could use, could use poetry. I found out that Doubleday didn't have a lot of money to pay for uh, permissions, and so I called back to the poets. Okay, after meeting every one of them in person, I called them all over the country and said, "Look." Uh, this is a this is something f good for all of us, and I need uh, I need permission to use you know to use your poetry. Um, I, you know, Doubleday is not going to pay pay money for uh, permission. So she said, uh, yeah. She said Redmond. She said use it. You know. She said, but I'm not going to live to see the book uh, published. I said, what do you mean? She said, I'm very, I'm a sick old woman. Now, this is 76. Margaret died in 98. <laughs> I mean, it was 74, 75. <laughs> I'm a sick old woman, she said. And so that's how I got to use um, anything that was more than two lines. And um, uh, the length of the Hughes estate was very kind. And just, uh, you know, so, so that was almost like an extra. Uh, another a return of sorts, mm -hmm. you know. Now it's the third return to go to 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 bury my friends and and colleagues and comrades. But um, yeah, that somebody asked uh, what was unusual. One thing that was unusual was hearing uh, Robert Hayden and Cleveland, the esoteric poet. Russell, Russell Atkins used the word motherfucker because they were they were kind of proper <laughs> men and uh, you know everybody was just blown out you know Robert Hayden the epitome of a scholar bow tie and as Alvin Albert says in one of his poems uh, glasses thick as the bottom of coke bottles <laughs> so he looked it was strange because you're looking through these glasses and they're magnifying or demagnifying his eyes and he's looking at you and you're looking at these, you know. And he was, he was quoting students at Fisk. You know, they drove him out of Fisk. 
you know, more or less. And he said, uh, they said, motherfucker, fuck you. <laughs> Who reads your black ass anyway? <laughs> We read Leroy Jones, nigga. We read <laughs> so he told me that sitting in a room at, at the Inter-American Writers Congress in Buffalo, New York, um, uh, just in his suite, you know, telling me about it. And 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 uh, the poet in Cleveland, the same way, he lived with his mother much of his life till she died. So he was very, um, very demure and. Uh, he, the same thing, he got up and he had a poem that had MF, you know, in succession a few times. And, you know, we were just shocked, you know, like, you know, these very proper men, <laughs> oh, you know. Whereas we suspected with Sterling Brown, because Sterling Brown said, who was your daddy? I mean, he just started signifying, playing a dozen with you right away. <laughs> who was your daddy? And, and I know by the way he said it that he was signifying. And then he said, uh, you, got your, you, got, you got your doctor? I said, no, no, sir. He said, well, you did good. He talked about drum voices in the basement of his house, drinking rock and rye. Um, he said, you did good and did good. So those are some of the ideas um, and some of the experiences that went in that uh, backgrounded and foregrounded <laughs> the uh, work on and the release of drum voices. Um, yeah. Uh, I'd like to go a little more into the uh, into the it, uh, the depths of all of this, because you were uh, working on drum voices, or you were working on drum voices at the same time that the uh, black arts movement was unfolding, and we are uncertain about when it uh, went into hibernation. But you know, some mm -hmm. of this thing is still going on. Uh, but at you, so you, uh, you, uh, you also took time out from the Drum Voices project to edit the works of Henry Dilmas because you, the first works were coming out of the University of uh, Southern Illinois, I believe. Southern Illinois, yeah, right. A, a, I remember white covers. That's right. And everything. Hardback. Yeah, mm -hmm. hardback. So um, one of the questions that I think you can help us to understand the complexity of this period was what is most, in your mind, most misunderstood about the black arts movement? The work in the community, the corollary to on the campus um, or in the bank or the social work, or running an art center, or a free breakfast program, the incredible reading. When I ran into Quincy Troop, he was, he was an encyclopedia of third world literature. I was steeped in Greco Roman, in the Greco Roman Hebraic Christian tradition of literature. The think tank. In this instance, under my leadership, I didn't lead everything, developed what I call the Afro-Asian, Indian, Hindu, Muslim, Island, Latin continuum. That was my contribution to the think tank, and then we began to flesh that out. But the point is, um, Charles Rowell makes a, makes a big ado or much ado about how well read the poets are in his anthology. I mean, how do we learn to write <laughs> in the black arts movement? I mean, we, we were walking inside, I mean, I just, you know, recited Tolson, but we knew more, a lot more about the other poets. Uh, so. So everybody was reading. Everybody was reading, everybody was traveling. And everybody had an agenda. And I don't mean uh, an undercover agenda or uh, some, uh, uh, something underhanded. 
everybody had an agenda, everybody was working on something. So that, and, and we weren't in agreement. There were fights, there were shootouts, there were fist fights, you know, the, the whole Umbra thing where uh, there was a, a, you know, a blow up and uh, one guy who had gotten, who was tired of being um, uh, called names because he was gay, he whipped another guy, you know, within, you know, inches of his life. <laughs> Uh, which, you know, proved manhood, if you will, to some people. But there were so many uh, things to do. One of my students asked me, was I a member of a fraternity? And no, no offense, I said, I didn't have time for that nonsense. Once I, for one, I'd been a Marine, so nobody was going to pound me on my ass. <laughs> and two, I didn't have time. I had to go to jail. That's, this was pre-black arts, this is the early 60s. You know, we shall overcome <laughs> the hot summers. Um, and uh, she said that that was the first time that it had, have a, it had ever been brought home to her, the meaning of what we were doing. I just said, I had to go to jail. I didn't have time for that nonsense. <laughs> um, because we got arrested you know, hundreds of times. In East St. Louis, they filled the jails. They put us in the National Guard armory commandeered the buses. I mean, this is what we were doing. Okay, so you're doing all of that. You're in school. You got a job. We set up the experiment in higher education in East St. Louis, for example, an accredited two-year educational institution operated by Southern Illinois University. And who comes out of it? The Huddling Brothers, the filmmakers. And I can name other, other people. Um, so you're doing all of these things. You're running publishing houses. You're running recording companies. You're, you're, you're saying, come into consciousness. A retired janitor said to me not long ago in a fast food restaurant one morning, I stopped. He said, you know, I didn't know what you meant. He said, he said, he said I was, what is this nigga talking about, come into consciousness? <laughs> What is that come into consciousness? What is that coming into consciousness? And he said, I always thought you could just do it on your own. You didn't need a consciousness. He said, and I'd be setting up those tables and those chairs and those benches for those kids, for you and your truth to come through and talk to them. He said, and I just hated you, man. I really hated you. He said, but now, and it's, just, it's not just now. He said, but you were right. He said, I thought we could do it on our own that if you were tough enough and you had all your wits about you, you could do it. He said, but you, you were right. You all were right. They needed something. He said, I was, man, I really resented and hated you. Dressed all funny, you know. And he said, but yeah, he said, you all were right. You know, you, you need, they needed that kind of education. Um, so you're doing this, you're going into the schools, you're having rallies and you're having concerts every weekend. So then you, you go knock on all the doors of professional people. You go to the, um, the market, owners of markets. Uh, you go to the barbershops and beauty parlor, you solicit money. You feed the people. We brought, Amer we brought Leroy Jones to uh, Lincoln Park in East St. Louis in 1969, uh, and we fed everybody. We fed 1,500 people because those, those uh, store owners and those professional people and anybody in the neighborhood who had something, you know, the store owner would give us But this, is, this, is, this picture is of what you were doing and writing poetry and have a new poem for that weekend because I'm going to read between Huey and Angela. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I got to, you know, I got to be ready. Um, the, um, you're, you're editing Henry Dilma, shot to death May 23rd, 1968. Goes to New York to attend the wedding of a friend and try to find a publisher. And he's shot to death deep in the night of May 23rd in the subway at 135th and Lennox, now Malcolm X Boulevard, under yet to be 
clarified circumstances. Toni Morrison goes to visit Quincy Troop, and she said, what's up, what's up, what's up? He, he said, my buddy uh, just brought these out from Southern Illinois University. So she stands there, reads the two volumes, drop to her rump, and Quincy babysits for her two sons, Slade and who died earlier this year on the other one. Um, she drops to her rump and doesn't leave. It's light, it's dark, pitch black. She reads both of Dumas' books and said, Where can I, how can I find this guy? And he said, my friend, he teaches in California. We can call him. So she said, uh, I'd like to publish him. She was senior editor at, at, at Random House. Uh, a decade-long work. on Henry Dumas. By the way, I have these boxes of letters from Morrison um, who called me about 10 years ago and said, you know, those letters belong to Random House. I said, I ain't crazy, Tony. <laughs> 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 I think they belong to Red. They're my letters. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so she called, and then, then you're taking that on. Okay, you're writing drum voices, uh, or still researching in notes. So you take on Dumas, and we go through the decade of the, of the 70s, bringing out Henry Dumas from Random House. But then you also got your own books. So you do seven of your own, and, a, and an LP. Uh, okay, I'm just, I'm talking about myself. But I, I'm talking about, I'm, you know, you can, you can extend from that out to everybody. Right. Well, I'm glad Black you're River Writers about, Publishing House. Right. Yeah. I'm glad you're talking about yourself because if there's something that I think probably is misunderstood about the black arts movement is that the model for talking about it has two centers, Chicago and, and New York, forgetting about uh, East St. Louis, St. Louis, uh, uh, San Memphis, Francisco, Memphis, uh, L.A. College with uh, Sarah Webster, Sarah Webster Fabio, Fabio. Uh, and people on, out there. So with that model, you know, you think all of it was in one place. It wasn't. It was all over the country. And in many places, I think people were doing what you were doing in different ways, of course. Yes. So the question really becomes for 2013, Professor Redmond, of what's happened to that legacy in, to, in an active way? Or to put it simply, what are the creative agents doing this year? Well, you know, part of what, <laughs> what we were doing, you know, we were recording, and uh, the poet who photographed, the young poet, he was at Furious Flower. CP. No. Right? No, the young poet from, uh, he's in the Northeast. In fact, he sent me a book. Skin. Oh, yeah. Skin. He yeah. sent me a book. Yeah. 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 He does it. He takes pictures of me. <laughs> he's doing what some of us were doing. So that's one. Uh, and I suspect the fact that he sent me a book is saying something, you know, like what we used to do. We got him out to everybody right away, you know. Um, so that's just an example. Um, there are some people in Sacramento who are doing some wonderful things out of barbershops and galleries and women's centers. Um, they'll have the first Sacramento Black Book Festival in 2014. Uh, there's certainly Fur Furious Flower where the poets and the audiences are intergenerational and cross-gender, of course. Um, there's not enough of it, but I think, uh, I don't know how one can replicate what we did because we got together physically. We touched each other, you know, physically. I don't know how that can be replicated. I do see stirrings of it. Uh, you know, you, you hope when you see something like the Trayvon, Trayvon Martin uh, fiasco, debacle, tragedy, uh, that it will help bring uh, us together. Uh, in a way that uh, 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 will serve the interests of, of, of poetry and allied arts. 
Um, but um, we, um, the mentor, the me mentors and the mentoring is so important. Um, you and Leonard Moore, and I mean, I could go on, or Kevin Powell, and I mean, some of the people I just named, they're like walking encyclopedias of the Black Hearts Movement. Uh, there are poets, uh, Jabbar Asim, my own protege, called me his word father, uh, he'll, he'll correct me. He'll correct me on something that only I saw because I told him before and I forgot. Yeah, so it, it's there, it's not there in enough numbers and enough substance and it's not quite broad enough, but, I, uh, but it is there and we just, I did, I, for years I've been saying to people around me, I'm put everything in my head and your head. <laughs> and and uh, uh, th th there are also systems that we use when people say they want to study with you. You say, come over, here's the music, here are the books. I've got five hours of work to do. Now you're going to see if they're going to fidget, go in the bathroom every 10, 15, 20 minutes or go try to turn the TV on? Or will they find that, as my niece said, when she finished college, came to stay with me and she said, this is blinding, uncle. You know, you know, 8,000 LPs, tens of thousands of books. And I said, well, you wanted to come and stay with me. She finished college, you wanted to come and stay with me? This is what I do. So, and then, and then when they, you tell them, sir, come on Saturday morning at five, and then, if they can stand that for, uh, for, for several weeks, then he said, you'll take them in as an apprentice. But no nonsense, no nonsense. You know, it's just, uh, uh, besides, if you think about the, the program in this hugest context, then you get depressed. That's why you work like we have in East St. Louis. The Writers Club is 27 going on 28 years old. And uh, we meet the first and third Tuesday around, the, around that table without a beat, mm -hmm. a stoppage of a beat. So those are, the of, uh, uh, those are the kinds of things that we continue to do, uh, the Harlem Arts Salon, you know, in, in New York. Um, just uh, Third World Press. Thank you, Haki. He likes to remind people that uh, I beat up on him in drum voices. <laughs> That's an indication that we were in lockstep. I mean, Gwendolyn Brooks said that uh, one reason she loved uh, Haki was because he looked like Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> what was Jesus' skin color? What is Haki's skin color? He had a beard, you know, and I love Haki like a brother. He's come to everything, all my, all my birthdays, and when I'm grieving, he gets a plane from Chicago down to St. Louis. Um, but, but, but I, you know, I just had to ask Gwen, what was she thinking? Or what wasn't she thinking? To say that he reminded her of Jesus Christ. Well, you know, it's, you know, so we, we all, uh, the whole idea is, as I say, I go to the rehab centers all of the time. Crisis centers, we do, you know, my team and I. And the first thing I say is I know no one. There's no one with my sphere of association who is not in recovery. Nobody, I don't know anybody who's not in recovery. Me, <laughs> whether it's racism, sexual vagrants, um, reefer, white light, whatever it is. I don't know anybody who is not in recovery from something. So that's the first thing I say when I walk into one of these crisis centers. Um, so we, we, we work on it every day and I have always said uh, before I was born again in the 60s as a black man, I would translate German every day because that was my language. So I'd translate Thomas Mann or Rilke every day to stay sharp on German. Every morning I'd read five or six poems in German and read some Thomas and um, then I vowed that I would read something about Africa and the diasporas every day. 
So since I was 10, and I'm 75, that means for 65 years, I've written something every day. And since the mid-60s, I have kept my vow to bone up on African-American culture, African-derived culture every day. And so that, that's the legacy. Mm-hmm. That, that's, that's the carryover, one of the words that we started using in the 60s for those survivals, those Africanisms that are found in, the, uh, in, in Africa's diaspora, diasporas. Um, and so uh, that's, that's what I think. Now, in the poets, Kwame Dawes, Speaking of the poets. Brother Walker. Yes. Let's talk about Eugene Redmond. Let's talk about <laughs> Eugene Redmond as poet uh, and poet laureate and teacher. And I think I would really like for you to share with us parapoetics. Okay. In, in, the, in the first uh, printing, <laughs> with page th- he didn't knew the page. <laughs> I'm gonna so, go. I'm gonna go. But this is the you. Those of you who get this today will get uh, 50 pages more than the one he has. I'm gonna give him one, and um, 22 photos that follow me from high, high school graduation through the Marine Corps into the black picture of uh, Larry Neal and yours truly, and just different people. Gwen Brooks at her 70th birthday. Um, Let's see if it's, it's no, close. It's actually, you, 26. I'm sorry, I put 10 pages behind myself. Okay. Here's a. Um, I got moved around. I know okay. that. Okay. Uh, it was. Uh, hey, in, yeah. After, in, t- in a time of rain and desire, after, right after that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is a 20 something poet saying, saying, suggesting up an approach to the writing of poetry. And it's called Parapoetics. Appeared in my first book in a t- um, century of the Four Golden Pillars for my former students and writing friends in East St. Louis, Illinois. Parapoetics. Poetry is an applied science. Rewrapped corner wrap. Rootly eloquented cellular, cellular sermons. Grit reincarnations of Lady Day, Bird, and Otis. Silk songs pitched on round and rhythmic rumps. Carved halos for heroes and asserted maleness. Sounds and sights of fire tongues leaping from the lips of flame-stricken buildings in the night. Directions, apply poetry as needed. Envision, visualize, violate, shout, write, R-I-G-H-T, words, write, R-I-T-E. Cohabitate, gestate, impregnate your vocabulary, dig a parapoet. Parenthesis, replace winter with spring. Move Mississippi to New York, Oberlin, Ohio to East St. Louis, Harlem to the Summer White House, carve candles and flintstones for flashlights, carry your poems, grit teeth, bear labor love pains, have twins and triplets, fertilize poem forms with afterbirth, before birth, and dung, rearrange old words, study, strike tradition. Caution to parapoets, carry the weight of your own poem. It's a heavy load, L-O-D-E. Yes. yes. And I think of the form and spirit of this poem as informing much that you do and have done throughout your lifetime. So perhaps I should ask the odd question. 
how does or, or does this particular point uh, drive you in your mission, if you consider it a mission, as Poet Laureate of East St. Louis? Um, para, I carry the poet with me, and um, I'm an ambassador from my people to my people. The world. Um, I I work with language, you know. That's kind of a mundane statement, but uh, that's serious. Working with language. I walked into a a, cla a, a class of sixty students, about five to thirteen, two two Tuesdays ago in the East St. Louis Public Library. I played Miles Davis, who went to my high school. I set up some pictures of Jackie Jonah Kersey, who went to my high school. I then played some Leon Thomas, the great vocalist, who went to my high school. Told them about Barbara Ann Teer, who built a $10 million National Black Theater and Communications Art Edifice, who went to my high school. And then I said, if someone asks you a question, the answer to which you do not know, I'm going to give you two choices. Sir, ma'am, not being informed to the highest degree of educational accuracy, I hesitate to articulate for fear that I may deviate from the unstated path of rectitude. Or, mm hmm. <laughs> Now I say now between those um, between those two bookends, we can give fifty answers. You know, it could be. I'm sorry, I am not in command of the answer at the moment, but give me a couple of days to research it, and I will uh, respond. Or I don't know. Or and we go on like that. Like, well, when, when is language, when, when is language appropriate and what is the appropriate usage? Um, and so that, that's one thing that a poet does. It goes to, <laughs> goes to libraries in the summer for summer camp. And of course, we, we then buckle, buckle down and uh, get on with some quantasabas. Mm -hmm. And the quintessential poem, the quintessential poem in the, in the history of poetry for teaching kids and 90 year olds how to write a poem is Dream Deferred, the lead poem. Five similes. It's closed and open. It's the best poem in the world for teaching people to write poetry. Anything you, any poetic feature is in that poem. And most of us have, most of us ought to have memorized it. <laughs> So, and we got into that. Um, and so the poet then brings the consciousness, you know, we say get into consciousness. The, but the poet brings a, a special language to his community or her community. My poets and people in my community spell consciousness C O N. C-H slash or, or hyphen U-S slash or hyphen N-E-S-T. Get that, people. I mean, we're poets. We're serious. Like the solar system. You can figure that out already. By going to the classroom and I said they were talking about the solar system. And the kids, oh, come on. And then I write it on the board very methodically, S-O-U-L-A-R. 
and then fill the board with their definitions. And one will say, a little girl will say, you talk about my, what my mama do in the kitchen, ain't you? I say, yes, aren't I? <laughs> and it goes on from there. And when I finish, all the boards, when we finish, all the boards are filled. I don't, I don't give a, I don't give an example. All I do is write the word "sola" on the board. I'm talking fourth graders. I'm talking third graders. I'm talking high school students. I'm talking prisoners, mentally ill people, all women, all men, professionals. All I do is write that on the board. This, the solar. So whatever, everything we do, operates under the solar system. And we say that nine, maybe ten planets revolving around the sun. Our solar system is people are revolving around, going to, come. we dance a while. And you know, I'm trained by Dunham, so hey, you want a Yon Valu? Okay, you ready? And, and what goes with it? Homage to Dambala, the serpent god, and so I'm a serpent. Uh, that's what a poet, <laughs> that's the poet. Um, that's what a poet laureate does, connect them, of course, to the 60s and to the 50s and the 40s and the 30s. Um, and purveyor, conveyor of language and traditions. And if you speak, you say something, you name something, and you carry something if you speak. And that's what we uh, we suggest that's what I suggested to poet laureate, and that that's our uh, and of course lots of poetry just lots of poetry everywhere, um, you know sometimes on buses sometimes <laughs> on streetcars or uh, Amtrak or the wall as in Philadelphia. That's right with Sonia. Yes, Sonia. yes, yes, yes. I think uh, uh, for me it's always been very important that. Uh, drum voices, which I'm going to insist publicly that you write about uh, at some point before you oh, decide yeah. to go ahead and join uh, Tom Dent and the rest of people. Yeah. We're having fun. And um, um, Charlie Russell, does I know, does everybody know that uh, Bill Russell's brother, he wrote Five on the Black Hand Side? Mm -hmm. He made his transition uh, last week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if you. Yeah. So. We, I, I didn't know. Yeah, okay. But no, I'm, and so I, I just think it's very important that you you write about this, reflect on it as you wish, as a uh, because I think of it as a model for the work of the 21st century. No one is going to be able to uh, replicate what you did, but there are parts of this which serve as uh, excellent guides for what you ought to do it. If I'm being prescriptive, I'm prescriptive. So the other major contribution, and probably we'll have to fill up, I mean, uh, we'll end uh, with this. I'd like you to talk about, you said the, the Poet Laureate gives language back, or gives new language to communities. But the artist who uses a very different medium and certainly a different instrument also gives back. And that is mm. the, the, the visual artist, the photographer, or the photographer who thinks of herself or himself as a document maker, uh, who, who then uh, lays out grounds or foundations for very sophisticated readings and interpretations of things, people, events, for the making of history. 
So I'd like for you to share your, your thoughts about your use of the camera for all of these years, the uh, more than uh, 10,000, I don't know how many images you have at uh, the About library. Close uh, to uh, the yeah. two, two, more than 200,000. 200,000 images. Uh, you see, you keep multiplying by 20, that's, that's more. <laughs> and, um, and so how, do, uh, you know, I guess really in your own way, just tell us, what do you want done with this material? Okay, um, first I'd like to say that uh, 2016 will be the uh, 40th anniversary of the publication of Drum Voices, the book. And I would like your help, Dr. Ward, and Dr. Ramsey's well, uh, uh, help. And uh, I know um, Osala, does everybody know what Osala is? Does everybody, anyone not know what Osala is? Yeah. Okay, you want to? Hmm? Bless you, no, it's the same bless you too. You want to, you want to tell? Somebody raise their hand over here. You want to say what it is? Osala? Oh, you, you know, right? No, I'm not sure. Oh, okay, that's the Association for the Study of, of. Osala, oh, okay. Oh, Osala, okay. okay. Osala, okay. Yeah, the, the, the the, African American life and history. Okay, searching for the study of African American life. It was Negro life and history on the cottage initially, but uh, yeah. Okay, well, there was a panel for the 35th, right, Dr. Ramsey? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I'd like to maybe do something, uh, whether I'm around or not. <laughs> Let's do something. Well, you better be here. <laughs> uh, so we're talking, what, three years? Yeah. And I, I certainly like for uh, Dr. Ward and, and Dr. Ramsey to. To work, to work, help, help with the pro, uh, some kind of 40th anniversary um, uh, acknowledgement, you know, with maybe another preface and one by you, however, and and afterward and so on. Uh, so that that as far as um, my photographs, um, that was a pivotal moment in the photograph. My best friend died. We kept the vigil. I was in California. He had saved my life in the 60s and 70s. And um, brilliant man, um, he was dying. And so we were keeping the watch, the vigil, and I would come in and stay a while and go back and then other friends would come in. And um, I was taking pictures. And one of the friends, another writer said to me, you know, Red, you're getting more seriously into the photographs. And he said, picture taken is going to change you as a writer. And he just winked and drove on off to, to, to Philadelphia, back to where he was working. Um, and I sat down to keep the watch for a couple of weeks with, with our dying friend. And, uh, but the wink, it was kind of a, a sort of a happy, evil look on his face. Mm. <laughs> it's going to change you as a writer. Well. I, you know, I have all these photographs and I've been um, uh, studying people through the lens. I, I'm not sure what he meant, but I noticed that when I, as I got deeper into photography, I started to study people through um, telephoto lens, like, you know, maybe just looking at Margaret Walker and, you know, be at her house for five or six hours. And, just uh, kind of watching her, and maybe I wouldn't take as many pictures, but just looking at her. Or some other, or hockey, eating, eating uh, uh, we'd go on the road, and, high, and everybody would sit down and eat some ribs. <laughs> you have to know the joke, hockey is vegetarian, right? So hockey could take a peach and peel it with his teeth, eat it, and it would, it would be during the time that we would eat the meal. In other words, he would stretch out eating a piece of fruit <laughs> over, over the length of time that it took us to eat a meal, right? And that was just a, that was fascinating to me. <laughs> now he'd come over to the table and everybody would be eating all this pork and all that stuff. And he'd, he'd just... <laughs> and so I said, well, this is interesting. You know, it's just different people. So I suspected my friend meant that uh, you have to study people. 
more when you take pictures. And uh, Maya Angelou and Carolers, one morning we were all visiting Maya, so Maya got up, got a cup of coffee. Mari Evans got up with a wrap on, cup of coffee, got robes on. I come in my PJ and robes and somebody else, another one. Make you know there's like eight of us sitting around and I'm just like doing this, doing that, like studying people. Um, and so, so you get closer, I think. And so you, you want that as when I talked to Dr. Ramsey, he's done several exhibits of my photographs as far away as Ibadan, Nigeria, as close as um, East St. Louis City Hall, and um, you know, Atlanta, everywhere. Some, you know, University of Alabama has had an exhibit there, University of Illinois. And uh, so I'm thinking that, uh, you know, it's an extension of me. And um, I would just like for that to be known, you know. Um, you know, you, some people think, uh, think it's a violation, so you really have to be careful. I remember Roscoe Lee Brown was, he wanted you to take the picture and, and quickly and, and, and not be doing all that. See, so so I, he'd start cursing, so you had to, you know. You had to, yeah. That yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, so I would like, like uh, there's a center, and, and you, can, you can donate, you can go on, online and find the, 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 the website, Southern Illinois University. A nickel is not too small, $5 is not too small. They've got to raise uh, one and a half million dollars. They're about, uh, they may have a hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand dollars. Maya Angelou gave a dinner party at her New York home a fundraiser. Um, and so there's going to be a center um, that houses uh, about 500,000 of my items, you know, from all my travels and all over the world and go all the way back to high school and um, my travels in Southeast Asia, courtesy of the Marines. <laughs> um, but I, I, that's, that's what, what I, and, and everybody, if they don't know what I'm talking about, they find out before I leave. I go into an auditorium and I said, everybody in this room will be in the center. So your gr grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren can go to Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, you know, 75 years from now and see you. And, and often it's, it's kind of interesting because people don't know. They don't know what I do. They, they, they hear me read poetry. They hear me give a lecture. They didn't see the camera back. Mm -hmm. And so by the time when the dancers go on, then there I am. Then they, oh, now we see what he's talking about, that we'll all be in the center. <laughs> you know, we'll all be, uh, you know, enshrined there. And, and, and that's one thing that I like is that wherever I've gone, um, the, uh, wherever I've lived, wherever I've been invited, uh, I've, I've got a record of it. You know, I've got fly. In fact, I brought something for everybody here. From, this is the, the card advertising the premiere of this book in Sacramento a couple of weeks ago. So I brought enough of these to give everybody one. It's a nice bookmark. Quote from Maya Angelou. She sent this in for my 75th birthday. And she takes, borrows the word from one of my protégés, Rohan B. Preston. He's a lead theater critic for the Minneapolis Star Tribune. And with John Edgar Weidman's son, he edited something, edited something called Soul Fires, a collection of young, um, young writers, young black writers. But she borrowed the word Eugenius. He created that word. <laughs> and so she borrowed it in this quote. So uh, those are some of my thoughts um, about, about the pictures. And um, what, I, what I'd like to do is there's a man named um, Nwadiki, who is Nigerian, who writes in Swedish. And another man who was a communist named Jack Hirschman, a dear friend, who attended City College with Henry Dumas translated this Nigerian's poetry from Swedish into American English. 
And there's one poem in there called a short black poem, and it's less than 15 seconds. When I die, bury me in two graves. In the hearts of my friends, and in a short black poem. Mm. Isn't that something? Mm. Yeah, and it's really kind of like not magic. Mm -hmm. It's fortuitous that yesterday Tony Grooms was here. Speaking, Tony Grooms? Yes, speaking about Alan Polite and Wadiki and all other people all over right. there in Lund, Sweden. <laughs> Good yeah. God, he talking about Wadiki? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, you know, it's like. This happens. This happens, Gene. I'm going to ask you because I Woo! think we, we kind of like go run out of tape or yeah, whatever. Right. But yeah. I want you to pay for me, if you do me this favor, read uh, the tribute to your grandmother. Okay. Uh, grandmother's. Soul oh, verse. yeah, it's three, it's three Kwan Sabas. And the Kwan Saba, of course, is uh, seven lines, multiples of seven. And rigorous uh, research undergirds this. Um, what page is that? Well, on this version, is 236. Okay, it's probably close, yeah. Um, multiples of seven. And if you write a, a Kwan Saba. It's in section nine, because that's where you started. Yeah, if, if you write a Kwan Saba, and each one of the Kwan Sabas is a verse, then it, it has to, well, it ought to stand alone. Can't tell people what to do. But uh, it's, it's been used all over the world now. Yeah. And uh, this is called Upbringing, the Pedagogy of East Boogie, Three Kwan Sabas. And uh, East Boogie is the nickname for East St. Louis. Number one, grand grandmother soul versity. Whether churning lye into soap, earth into produce, clabber into butter, Sass into whipping, snow into ice cream, sermon into succor, hair into plat, body ash into glisten, theory into thimble, remnant into quilt, kitchen into sparkle, or what not into feast. Her edict was, get some learning, boy. Number two. School of weaving and bobbing. Every boy, girl, a garden of dreams. Crooning like Nat Cole, Eckstein, Johnny Ace. Chirping, belting like Billy, Ella, Big Mama. Bobbing, jabbing like Brown Bomber. Slinking circularly like Eartha and Catherine, copping cool like Mile, swinging low like dews, howling neath wolf's blues like Grandma's chariot gone home. Three, Academy of Low Heights, swinging low, fetching high, saluting, uh, let's get that again. I put it at the wrong angle for a Swinging low, fetching sky, settling morning, noon's evening sun. Arc architects of black studies riding hair trigger of double being into an all night pay laver and hearing bloodshot sages scream, we're schizophrenic with split personalities. Mount New Courses, a la Olauda, Sojourner and Malcolm. Back to East Boogie. Okay. Thank you so much, Woo! Professor Redmond. Thank you, man. I think you have uh, given us a wonderful moment in your life. I thank mm. you for that, mm. of uh, sharing with us what I think real generosity is as it comes from a poet. Thank you. Uh, and I, I don't say that lightly because I know too many poets who are alien to generosity. 
or they find generosity alien to them for any number of reasons. But you are in uh, that tradition of poets for our people, and our people are the people of the earth. Uh, that, unfortunately, is still with us, but at a level where we don't understand that our feet must be anchored in soil. Hmm. People are poets for the people of the earth on uh, airplanes on the way to Paris or something. Hmm. Hmm. But nobody <laughs> wants to get down in the groundings with their brothers and sisters like Walter Rodney. Mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. So, again, Ashe, thank you. Ashe, Thank you. 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 Thank you.